If all these people moved, you can too. What? I like that. Whoever sits outside the fold sings a solo. All righty, Travis. <laughs> They're in deep thought back there. <laughs> you better sit down before you sing a solo. <laughs> Rexanne is the outside fold. <laughs> yeah, she's like the she's sep she's separated from the pack. All right. Well, the idea behind this was kind of make it like Christmas at home kind of feeling. You know, we all kind of gather as close to the piano as possible, and just because Debbie can't hear apparently, um, and just so we can just kind of sit together as a family and. Um, because this is probably as close as y'all will ever sit on Sunday night. <laughs> I think this is the most packed I've seen it. <laughs> All right, well, let's start this evening. Let me pull this off so I can work a little better. 89, oh, come all ye faithful. We'll sing all three verses, and then guess what? You get to choose the rest. And we're starting. Oh, come all ye Joyful and triumphant, O come ye, O come ye to Bethlehem. Come and behold Him, born the King of Angels. O come, let us adore Him. O come, let us adore. Christmas style is what we're calling this. 86. By the way, if I don't know it, you get to lead it. If she don't know it, you get to play it. I wasn't able to get that disclaimer in before somebody fired off. First second and last. Oh, little town of Bethlehem, how still we see thee lie. Silent stars go by, yet in thy dark street shineth the everlasting light. The hopes and fears of all the years are met in thee tonight. For Christ is born of Mary and gathered all. Oh, 
proclaim the holy birth and praises sing to God the King and peace to men on earth. O holy child of Bethlehem, descend to us, we pray. Cast out our sin and enter in, be born. Heard the bells on Christmas Day. I heard the bells on Christmas Day. Their old familiar carols play, and wild and sweet the words repeat of peace on earth. I thought how as the day had come, the belfries of all Christian drums had rolled along the broken song of peace on earth, good will to men. And in despair I bowed my head, there is no peace on earth, I said. Oh, Lord Jesus. 
Jesus laid down his sweet hand. The stars in the sky looked down where he lay. The little Lord Jesus asleep on the Just do the ladies on the second verse. Here you go, ladies.
Number 87, Joy to the World. Thank you for this season, for this love. Lord, be with us, God, and direct us in our hearts all this week as we meet others and let them know the glory that you have. Lord, as we take up this offering, let it be used to enhance all of the things that we do and say for you. In Jesus' name, amen. compliment one another a little bit. That's cool. I like that. You know what I've noticed this, Austin? I uh, I noticed this right away. When your mama's around, you're a better boy. <laughs> we might need to, we might need to see if she might want to come over here all the time. Huh? You think? No. <laughs> oh, what's the deal? Let's see. Where's David at? David, two words for you. Stanford, McCaffrey that came to me while I was thinking here, okay? We were talking. Do you guys have that problem? I mean, you know, somebody asks you a question, you know, two things you want to recall, and it just doesn't file up. You know, it's that old computer is full. It just kind of a clunk, clunk, 
flunk, you know, you, you understand, and it finally comes up, well, anyway, good to see you tonight, you guys glad to be here, yes. you're a happy bunch, it sure is good, sounds good, you know, I like to hear you sing, this is a good time of the year to sing, you know, I've noticed this, don't do that ladies and men anymore, okay, <laughs> I sound a lot better if Sherry Lynn's singing, okay, yeah, if I'm sitting here singing with her, I sound a lot better. All right, so uh, you, that's why you played louder. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, yeah. What about you guys? You guys notice that? Yeah. Your favorite one to sit by while you're singing? I always like Sherry Lynn. I choose her. I chose her 50 years ago. I'm still choosing her. She's a pretty good one. She's on my side. I hope you find one like that, buddy. Uh, you'll listen to your mama. You'll you'll be, do the right thing. Get one just like mama, right? Get one that loves you like mama loves you. Takes good care of you. Good to see you tonight. I, you know, I told you I, I'm gonna I'm gonna try to preach all all December about God's love, it's positive things, real positive uh, blessings to us, you know. And so uh, that's what I'm gonna continue tonight. I, I, I'm gonna continue my treasure the treasure hunt. Uh, I, I've decided that you pay a lot better attention if I get out at 12 o'clock on Sunday morning. Have you guys not? Uh, you, you guys kind of drift a little off about, yeah, about about two after 12. You start really going down. You know, I mean, it's terrible when you know when when Austin's asleep over there and I'm trying to give the invitation. Right? I'm not going to pick on you anymore. All right? I promise. Well, maybe I won't promise. There you go. You need it. So so anyway, uh, you know, a good friend of mine when I first started preaching. He was he was deacon in the church and and uh, and I I had that problem of preaching too long you know sometimes and he said you know a, a good sermon is just like good bologna he said it doesn't matter where you slice it it's still bologna on both sides you know now, I don't know what he meant by that he said cut that thing off it'll be okay you can pick it back up later right well anyway it's been a good Sunday hasn't it beautiful Sunday yeah isn't God good to us you know I think. I think if anything, I, I hope that uh, through this season that uh, we would really focus on on Him. You know, uh, a lot of times we focus on presents and gatherings and dinners and and, and uh, a lot of a lot of things like that. You know, a lot of things compete with the reason for the season, right? But when we when we focus on Him, uh, we start looking for His activity. We focus on him; he'll bring his activity to our attention, and, and I think it's good for us to learn how he works, uh, to see uh, through the word how he dealt with the children of Israel, and to know that he deals with us in that same way. There's something that we need to get straight before we start trying to do this, though, and that is that uh, that we're not the center of all that God is doing. Okay. God is about the kingdom business. Now, praise God, He includes us in that. He includes us in the kingdom business. And He brings us into the kingdom business. If uh, it, I, I know I've asked you this before, and I know that not many of you studied the Experiencing God classes back in the 90s when Henry Blackaby brought out this study. But it's such a good study, and, and it helped me. I don't know whether it helps you or not, but it helped me be able to identify the activity of God around me and then to see how important it is is that I uh, aggressively join God in his work the treasure hunt when God gave me this particular sermon the treasure hunt it was like God says here is the wonderful treasure that I want you to experience will you go find it will you find it by the way I'm going to show you the way to find it See, God, God doesn't just leave us out in the dark. He says, I want you to find this treasure that I have for you. And, and, and that treasure is, is all centered around the Lord Jesus Christ and our relationship with Him that we might love Him with all of our heart, mind, and soul and love others. All right? That's the treasure that God has for us. And so He leads us in that direction. So right off the bat, the, first, the realities of God that were brought out in the study of uh, experiencing God, 
just illustrated for me. And let me just let me just uh, show you how. First of all, the first reality of of experiencing God was that God is at work all the time. I like that, don't you? I like work. I like you know if I'm at home, I'm not usually sitting around. I am working because I, I like to work. It is pleasure to me to work. I like to build things. I like to do things. I I like to work, and so. I can identify with that, and I know that, that my Heavenly Father is at work constantly. Now, I, I've told you this, that I was raised on a dairy farm until I was 16 years old, and, and you guys know probably a little bit about dairy farms, and that is that it's a lot of work, and it was a family dairy farm. My, my dad was the CEO, you know, and, and my mom was, uh, she was the vice president, first vice president, and they had four kids, and we were the laborers, you know. <laughs> We worked for them. Uh, but no, we always had something to do. And God and Dad made sure that we were involved in what was going on on the farm. Well, that just made sense to me. I could relate to that. When, when it was said, my heart went to my childhood, and I said, you know, you know I, I know my daddy was not God, but he taught me some things about my relationship with God and how God is always at work in his kingdom business and he uh, he is developed. He is a, he is desiring a relationship with us, and so he's aggressively seeking. You don't have to run for God. You, uh, God is seeking you, all right. And so he is seeking a love relationship with you. He wants you to come to him. He wants you to come near to him. He wants you to find the treasure. He wants you to be involved because he wants to show you exactly where to go to get the treasure that he has for us. So he is continually seeking a love relationship with us, that, that relationship that is, that is real and it's personal. You know, I, I told you I, I fell in love with this little girl 50 years ago and asked her to marry me. And I asked her to become a part of me. I, you know, we became a part of each other. And our love relationship is real and it is very personal. That's the kind of relationship that God desires with us. Something that we don't have to worry about whether He loves us or not. We don't have to worry about that because He does. He's shown us, He's demonstrated it, and He continues to demonstrate it every day of our life. So He seeks us out and He says, I just want to love you. And as we're loving in this relationship, we've got kingdom work to do. Would you join me in this kingdom work? Will you be a part of this? Will you let yourself find the treasure and find what the treasure is encouraging you to do and then do it? Just become involved. Be, become a part of that. And so we, we see this, that, that God, third reality is God invites you to become involved in His work. He says, come on down. It is time for you to get involved. You are, you know, it's, it's kind of like we as little children. You know, a lot of people think little children can't work with we don't work. We don't work kids anymore. You know, it, it's almost a sin. It's in fact, it's against the law to work kids. Well, kids enjoy work. It's taking joy away. I mean, when when my daddy involved me in the work on the farm, it made me feel like a man. It made me feel that I had worth, that I had significance. You know, we we worry about all those things, and we look for ways to help kids have significance and worth and involvement and activity, don't we? we? Well, let them work on a farm a little bit and get involved with, with the activity that goes in a farm. Yeah, you, not everybody who lives on a farm, but you can involve your kids in the activity. I've got a three-year-old grandson. Now, his attention spans about that long, but he likes to do. He's looking for things to do. Now, if you don't involve him, he's going to do things you don't want him to do. But if you involve him, then at least for that 10 minutes of attention span that he has, he will enjoy it and he'll do it, right? That makes sense, right? So God knows we are about that same. How long is your attention span? You know, I found, I found out since I became a pastor, I, I learned a lot about going to school and how to study. I didn't learn all the way through college, I, at high school and college. I didn't learn what I should have, you know. But, but as I became a pastor and I had to study 
uh, every week still do, have to study and I have to spend time with God. But I have found that my attention span is about 15 minutes, about like my three-year-old grandson. It's about 15 minutes. Okay, I know. I'm, I'm sorry, but it is. It's about 15 minutes. And about every 15 minutes, I have to kind of do something else. I, got to, I have to go do this or do that. And then I come back and I get another 15 minutes. And then, I, you know, God knows that we're that way. Some of you have got great tension spans. You can be on task all day long. You can be at kingdom work all day long. And God just loves it. He just feeds you with information about how, what to do and how to do it. Now, some of us have got this 15-minute deal, and we just kind of do it in spurts, you know. But he's got a place for every single one of us. And what's so good about it is, is that he is capable of being involved in every one of our lives at the same time, just like he indwells us all at the same time. Jesus said, I've got to go away so that the comforter might be able to come so that he could do just that, that he could get involved in each one of our lives. Amen. Isn't that good? So he is constantly trying to involve us in his work. And so he speaks to us through the work of the Holy Spirit. He speaks to us in a way that we know it's him. And we know his voice. And we, we learn how he talks and what he says and, and, and just what he would say. You know, I, I think about my daddy. I still remember the tone of his voice. And I knew when he was talking directly to me, and I knew what he was saying, and I knew exactly what he wanted me to do. My Heavenly Father is the same. It is very similar in that, that we know his voice, and we know what he sounds like. And sometimes we don't want to do what he wants us to do, but still yet, we know that if we love him, and as he's shown us that he loves us, that it's good for us to do what he's telling us to do. Now, he not only does this as individuals, but, guys, he does this as churches. You see, just as sure as there's a treasure for each one of us to find, there is a treasure for we as a church to become a part of his kingdom work. And the only difference is, is that we join together. We are one body. You see, we're one body struggling to try to find God's will. You know, I... It just kills me a lot of times in prayer meeting and in prayers. We, we say, well, God, we, we just want to find your will. Show us your will. When God is showing us his will, he's already shown us his will. He's shown us more of his will than any of us will ever do. Because he speaks to us in our heart different things. He speaks to us when we read the Bible, doesn't he? When we open this word up and, and we read this, you know, we read about this treasure. When, when, I, when I read it in, in Proverbs 2 that I read this morning, it says, My son, if you receive my words and treasure my commands within you so that you incline your ear to wisdom and apply your heart to understanding. Yes, if you cry out for discernment and lift your voice for understanding, what is God saying? He said, I'm speaking to you. Now, will you listen? And will you speak back to me? Will you have a conversation with me? Will you adjust yourself so that we can have this love relationship, so that we can be a part of the kingdom work, and we can join together, we can be a team. We're not going to be one going this way and one going that way. We're going to be a team, and we're going to work together. Now, God wants us to do that as an individual. You know, a lot of times we have things pulling us this way and pulling us this way, you know, personally, right? Families pulling on us. They want some of us. Jobs pull on us. It wants some of us, you know. Communities pull on us. Kids pull on us. Grandkids pull on us. You feel like, you know, pretty soon you feel like, man, everybody's pulling on me. I just don't know what to do. God says, just listen to me. Just do what I say. He speaks to us through the circumstances of our life. He speaks to us through the church. He he speaks to us in different ways, but it's always about kingdom business and our involvement in kingdom business. He wants us to find the treasure, the treasure that can be ours, and it can be everyone's. It can be not only us as individuals, but it can be ours as a church. We can come together as a church, and we can love one another. And we can come together as a church and we can love God together. It takes a lot of forgiveness for a family to love one another the way God wants them to love, right? 
It takes a lot of forgiveness for a church to love one another the way God intends for us to love. Now, another reality we see that God speaks, and he, when He speaks, He reveals some things. First of all, he, he reveals His purposes. All of a sudden, we start to get it. We get what the kingdom business is all about. It's not about us individually. It's not about this church. As a church, it is kingdom business. And it is all centered around the kingdom work that is around us. What do you think we're supposed to be doing until the Lord comes back? You see, we're so busy with those things pulling on us that we've forgotten the assignment that Jesus left us. And that is just to be evangelist. To be so involved in His work that we cannot help but deliver the gospel message by just the way we live the way we walk through life and just as a church be evangelistic that we're, we're constantly thinking about kingdom souls that we, we could be wiped off of this earth at any time Jesus could come back or we could be at uh, we could leave this place we can lose our life we are fragile amen and, and that is our biggest fear is for destruction but, but it's not God's biggest fear God's biggest fear is that we won't be involved and we won't find the treasure you see, we won't be involved in kingdom work. And so he, he says, I'm going to speak to you and I'm going to reveal my purpose to you. And then he says, I'm going to reveal my plan of how I'm going to accomplish it. And how I'm going to involve you in this plan. And then most of all, he says, I'm going to reveal myself to you. Because you know what God knows? He knows that if you really know him, that if you're walking closely with Him, if you're in that close, loving relationship, that you can't help but love Him. Some people are that way, aren't they? If you're around them, you can't help but love them. I could, I could start naming names right in this room. You can't help but love them because they're lovable. Now, to some of you, not very lovable, but God wants you to be lovable. You know? Huh? Yeah. You're not very lovable. A lot of people, you know, you, you always think it's always somebody else that's causing you to be miserable. That's right. You're always blaming somebody else. All oh, those who, oh, that, those folks over there and those people live on, that sit over there on the north side or the south side or the back or the front, you know, this and this and this and this. God says, will you listen to me? I'm going to reveal it to you myself and it'll show you the kind of love that he wants us to give to other people. Now, there's another reality that always occurs, and that is, is that when we know, even when we know God's will, when we know He wants us to find the treasure, there is a crisis of belief that comes into our life. This can't be true. I can't do it, God. I don't care what you say. I can't forgive some of these things that have been done. I can't be involved. I can't be evangelistic. I can't teach a Sunday school class. I can't visit my friends or my neighbors and, and those around me. I can't do this and I can't do that. That is the crisis of belief that we go through. Every single one of us go through it. You can identify it in your life. We have little bitty crises of belief, and then we have huge crises of belief. Sometimes it involves our career. Sometimes it's, it's what God, where God wants to send us, you know. I remember when I surrendered to God, not just to the ministry, but to be a missionary. When I told God that, and Sherry Lynn and I did this together in Glorietta one year, we said, God, wherever you want to send us, we want to go, but don't send us to Africa. <laughs> no, no, you know. He, he says, I want, to, I want you to go. And I remember it was just as clear as, as you talking to me when God said, Travis and Sherry, and we both could hear God saying that, We've got to surrender to this and be, be available to God to be used by Him. Little do we know that he, he wasn't going to necessarily send us halfway around the world. He sent our daughter halfway around the world as a missionary. That's harder than going yourself. When you've got to send the one that you love the most halfway around the world to do what God wants you to do. But you see, if we really love Him, 
then the crisis of belief has to go away. Because not only do we love Him, but we trust Him. We trust Him with ourselves. We trust Him with our little kids and our family. We trust Him with our church. That He's very capable of guiding our church if we'll just get out of the way and let Him do what He wants to do. And that is involve us in the kingdom work that He has for us. And then, praise God, we learn to experience Him in such a way that the next catastrophe or the next challenge or the next instruction to go find the treasure is a lot easier. Do you remember the treasure hunt? Think about it in your own life. When you were just a little kid and you were involved in a party at school or someplace in someone's home and they said, we've got treasures for you to find. And then they had a list of instructions for you to go through to find the treasure. And the hardest obstacle was to get over the first instructions and find that this is easy. If I'll just do what it says, I'll find it. I'll find the treasure. And then the next one is easier, and the next one is easier, and the next one is easier, and all of a sudden you're right in the middle of the treasure. Maybe you didn't even know it. It was right under your nose, and there it is. You see, that's, that's like experiencing God and walking with God and doing what God wants you to do. Now, this morning, you know, I, I ended with... Uh, with a verse out of Proverbs, Proverbs one twenty eight, It's a sobering verse. It says, Then they will call on me, but I, I will not answer. They will seek me diligently, but they will not find me. The Bible is full of contrast. This is what it's like without me, and this is what it's like with me. Which do you choose? Do you choose to be without me? Or do you choose to be with me? It's as plain as that. You might be saying, well, you know, I haven't seen God at work around me and I don't know when. You might say, well, you know, I've been a Christian for these all these years, but I really don't hear from God. I hear other people talking about experiencing God and walking with God and getting answers from God. But I really don't experience it personally. You see, somewhere down the line, if you will ev evaluate your relationship with God, if you're experiencing that, you haven't heard God speak to you, there was some place down the line that He challenged you to take a step and you made a choice. You faced that crisis of belief and you said, I don't believe I want to, God. I did that for nearly 20 years on my call for preaching. 20 years, I walked away from God. And I said, God, I'll be a good man. I'll be a good Sunday school teacher. I'll be a good deacon in the church. I'll be a good father and a husband. God, I can't preach. I don't want to preach. I don't want to be involved in the way that you want me to. You see, I faced a crisis of belief over and over and over again. And I said, no, no, no. Until one day, God revealed to me a truth. And that is that if I'll just depend upon Him, I can do whatever He has called me to do. And He put me in such a position that I was tickled to death to walk that aisle and say, God, I'll preach, I'll teach, I'll do whatever you want me to do. Please just involve me. I want to be a part of your work. You see, if you look at your life and you say, well, I just don't have that real and personal relationship that I know I need to have, let me just tell you right off the bat is that it's not his fault. 
my fault. It's our fault for saying no when we face that crisis of belief and we just couldn't muster up enough integrity to say yes to what God was telling us to do. It happens to us as individuals and as I've seen in the pastor for the last nearly 30 years, it happens to us as churches. And we've become a group of people that say no to God and say, I think we know better about where we need to go and how we need to get there. You see, a church that humbles themselves, prays, seeks God's face, that's, that's a people that do exactly what it says in the Word. Second Chronicles 7 14 that we do just as he has told us to do to, to, to listen to him and be obedient to run away from our sin to ask God to forgive us of our sin and look and see how he hears and how he heals and how he forgives and see how he works in the kingdom work that he has for us to do you see, there's contrast here. There's contrast of, of being all that God wants to be. I, you know, I see a lot of times folks are scared of judgment. Are you scared of judgment? You know, one of these days when the Lord comes back, there, there's going to be what we'd call the judgment of God, the judgment that we'll face. Praise God, we as Christians, we pass because Jesus has paid the price for our sins. Amen? But you know, I, I'm faced with this. Do, do I want what I deserve? Or do I want what God wants to give me? Well, which would you rather have? Would you rather have what you deserve or what God wants to give you? You see, God wants to give us something very, very special. But many of us choose to go the other route and say, I hope that my scales drop over to the good so that I'll receive something for my good. And God says, none of you are good enough. If you all sin and you all fall short of the glory of God. But, you see, you know the contrast in John 10.10, 10, the evil one, he comes to kill steal and destroy. There's a contrast. But Jesus said, I've come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. You see, oh God, obeying God makes us receive what He chooses to give us. In Proverbs 2.5, you can see it in your word, you're, you're just a little ways over there, but Proverbs 2.5 it says, then you will understand the fear of God and you'll find the knowledge of God. Then all of a sudden, what God wants to give us is an understanding of the fear of God. Very, very clear. And it says, and you will find the knowledge of God. You will receive what God has for you. It is the gift of life, the abundant life that God wants to give us. I think Solomon grasped it. At the end of of uh, Ecclesiastes after, at, at the end of Solomon's life I think he grasped what God was saying to him when, when he said fear God and keep his commandments for this is the whole duty of man not anything else he said fear God and keep his commandments for God will bring every work into judgment including every secret thing whether it is good or whether it is evil John or Proverbs, Proverbs 3, just one page over, verse 13. Well, you know, Proverbs 3 is that one we love. You know, it says in verse 1, it says, My son, do not forget my law, but, but let your heart keep my commands for length of day and long life and peace. They will, 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 be add, will add to you. Let not mercy and truth forsake you, bind them around your neck, write them on the tablet of your heart, and so find favor and high esteem in the sight of God and man. Now you all know this one. Five, five it says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him, and He'll direct your path. 
Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. It will be health to your flesh and strength to your bones. Honor the Lord with your possessions and with the first fruit of all your increase so that your barns may be filled with plenty and your vats will overflow with new wine. My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord nor detest his correction. For whom the Lord loves, he corrects just as a father, the son in whom he delights. Verse 13, listen. Happy is the man who finds wisdom and the man who gains understanding for her proceeds are better than profits of silver and her gain than fine gold. She is more precious than rubies and all the things you may desire cannot compare with her. Length of days is in her right hand and in her left hand riches and honor. Her ways are ways of pleasantness and all her paths are peace. She is a tree of, the, of life to those who take hold of her, and happy are all who retain her. Do you want me to read more? Isn't it good? Didn't you hear God speak to you in your heart, in the need of your heart? I don't know what your needs are. Your needs are a lot of times we're different in our needs, but they're all the same. They're all centered around God and how He answers the prayers that we have and how He guides us through this life. Proverbs 3, 33 and 35, it says, The curse of the Lord is on the house of the wicked, but his ble He blesses the habitation of the just. Surely He scorns the scornful, but He gives grace to the humble. The wise shall inherit glory, but shame shall be the legacy of fools. What is his message for us today, guys? What is the treasure hunt all about? You may be good. You may have to go back to square one, like I have over, over and over again. Square one and say, "Okay, God, I see that you're speaking to me, and I know what you want me to do." I'm back to square one. You ever heard that term? I'm back to square one. You know what he's saying? I give up. I no longer want to be God of my life. I want you to be God. I don't want what I deserve. I really don't, God. But I'll be glad to take what you're willing to give me. What you're willing to provide. How you want me to live. What you want me to Oh, church, church of God, won't we hurry up and get there before it's too late? How long are we going to hold out from God what so rightfully He deserves? And that is our total and complete devotion. We're going to close tonight with a time of prayer. It's important for us to speak to God. Probably more important for Him to speak to us and us listen to Him. Right? So this is a good time for that. Those that you would have prayer requests, just quickly, let's name those prayer requests. Who's first? Yes, Richard. Pulpit well, committee. Important decisions coming, guys. They're going to be here before you know it. Others? Yes, Kevin. Yes. Excuse me, Kevin. Amen. You know, we, we pray for that, but God is demanding it. Okay? God is demanding it. He's saying that's the least that you can do to be a part of my kingdom work. Excuse me? Excuse me? Amen. Amen. Go into it. Others, quickly. Okay. Okay. Others. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Others.
Any others? Lord, I didn't even recognize you sitting over here. You're way too close, buddy. Huh? <laughs> Been awake all the time. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> She's been nudging you, Angie. Other prayer requests? Okay, we're, we're just going to spend some time praying. And when you're finished, well, you just ease out of here, okay? And have a, have a great week in the Lord. I hope you see some things and experience some things that you hadn't in a long time or maybe for the first time. Thank you so much.